free tailgate. Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Rocking and rolling here on a Thursday, the most interactive day of the week here at the cover three podcast as we'll be diving into the big old bag of mail those of you who've gone in left us a five-star review and in that review put your mailbag question we're going to hit some of those we also are going to be going all throughout the chat tailgate providing plenty of great conversation topics and we'll dive into some of those as well uh want to begin with more fallout and more follow up from last night's emergency podcast uh, you obviously already know the news itself but we've got more pieces to understand how it came to be uh what's next for michigan some details uh, along the way as well so danny um i know you were you were coach i didn't know you were coaching basketball all right so oh yeah sixth grade girls travel basketball wellington wolves let's go what well, what's the over under on these willing like on, on on these games? Yeah, what's the score normally? <laughs> yeah, um, if I think it's the first team to thirty, can usually okay. thirty points is a good number. You know, all right, ten, so, ten minute quarters or, or you guys playing halves? No, or, no, or a little really? shorter than that. A little shorter okay. than that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, right. you know, oh, Wellington Wolves, <laughs> ride or die. Oh. Let's go. Uh, what? Some time to process it, some time to think about, you know, the Harbaugh side of things, the Michigan side of things. Um, you know, as we sit here on Thursday, you know, where where are you at with uh, where Michigan goes? You know, Jim Harbaugh's time at Michigan. What really stands out to you? Um, You know, it's interesting because when Saban retired, there was a scramble because it was a surprise. This was not like we had kind of been expecting this. It was like, where is he going to go? But, you know, if he would have went back to Michigan, it wouldn't have been a shock either. But we were kind of prepared for it. So there's nothing really that caught us off balance. Um, I do think looking at this, it does make a tremendous amount of sense from, you know, a lot of things that we talked about. Like, you know, he, he's he played in the NFL for a long time. Um, like, I think he's different than a Kirby Smart or a Dabo Sweeney or other college coaches who you think it's probably their ultimate job is winning a national championship. And it's great. And they've been able to achieve it. I don't think they have lifelong dreams of going to the NFL. And I think with Harbaugh, he does. And he always has. And he's been there and been close. And he's got to sit there and watch his brother do it now. Um, I do. I, I still wonder what, what the decision factors were that have to do with the NCAA, that have to do with the sanctions that could be looming, uh, that just tired of having to deal with, you know, the BS that he does with the ridiculousness of the NCAA um, also the portal, also NIL, also the uncertainty of college football. Um, but I think it's, I think it was the perfect time for him to jump. Only the second time we've seen a coach win a national championship and not return to the school. First time we've seen him jump to the NFL. The only other time Tom Osborne retired at Nebraska after 97 I minutes mean, that speaks to how rare it is to make this jump. But I think when you consider Harbaugh's history, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, God, the next 30 years for Michigan are going to suck if it goes anything <laughs> like it did for Nebraska. <laughs> hey, Taylor. Sharon Moore is going to get fired after going nine and three, seven times, and then it's going to be a long, slow decline. Hey, Tailgate says Nebraska is a sleeping giant. They woke him up. I don't know if y'all seen that, but there's a lot of Nebraska optimism. I, I need to. I need to take some more time to dig dig in Finally. before I give my professional uh, opinion on that. But yeah, Nebraska's good. Hopefully I think, not. I not think it's that. about time Nebraska hyped itself up during an off season. That has never happened in prior off seasons. Hey. I, I mean, look, I I think Matt Rule can coach. They went out acquired a co OC. I'm look. No, I get it. This keep year, distancing yeah. themselves from Satterfield. I, I'm willing to buy in. All right, so uh, one thing that we talked about a lot, again, we just we went live you know, maybe 10 to 15 minutes after the initial Adam Schefter tweet, so we were taking things on air, trying to give you reports as we got it. 
there is, and I, I think Tom said it near the end of the show, but there is a waiver process if Michigan wants to be able to get through this seven day, you know, the job must be posted for seven days. And all you have to do is make an argument that it's necessary for like the success of the operation. And when it comes to roster retention and this 30 day transfer portal window, it should not be hard for the University of Michigan to argue that if they do want to promote Sharon Moore, um, accelerating that process is necessary for retaining the roster. So we'll, we'll see. Um, it might be by the weekend, might not. We'll, I mean, Danny, you, are you cool? If it's Sharon Moore, thumbs up. What'd you say, Tom? I said it might already be done. That's, I think through. it's inevitable. I think it probably is a done deal if they have to do this stupid seven day waiting thing. I mean, there's ways around it. They can tell the players. I mean, but that doesn't, mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, you talk about tampering, trying to poach them. I'm sure a ton of coaches are reached out to them. I saw a great tweet from a Bama site that said, we're shopping for Michigan players like we're shopping on Amazon, like because Alabama can't go anywhere except for Michigan to look potentially taking players. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it'll be Sharon Moore. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. He's been there. Um, he's got the experience from being on the, on the sideline. I do think it's going to be interesting to see, like, every, this is the honeymoon phase. Like, every, everything looks great right now, you know? Everyone's happy for Harbaugh. Everyone's happy for Sharon Moore. Like Tom said, let's see what happens if they're 9-3 and three the first year. Let's see. Uh-oh, he wasn't ready. You know, it's just, we're going to play this back, and it's, again, why you say, and I give it a C plus. Oh, you know, uh-oh, here running. comes Texas. Here comes yeah. a non-conference game against the Longhorns that are loaded up. You know, it, it, it'll be very... uh very interesting uh, as Sharon Moore looks to to keep all that together. All throughout the show, uh, going to pull some things from the uh, the Cover 3 tailgate. This one comes from Richard. If I gave you these four teams, Georgia, Ohio State, Texas, Oregon, or the field, who are you taking for the 2024 National Championship? Again, the four teams. So it's this group of four, Georgia, Ohio State, Texas, Oregon, or the field. But don't check the odds. Just do it off the top of your head. Don't run a math equation. Yeah. Come on. What you got? No, like, it's, it's clearly you, you take these four. Okay. I just, I'm trying to figure out just how bad this actually is. Oh, yeah, in terms I'm of like usually this. a field guy. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm usually a field yeah. guy, but not in this circumstance. Yeah, give me the four. Wow. You, you at least got to make it interesting and take Georgia or Ohio State out. Yeah. So you're saying that with <laughs> Georgia. Or what if it was Ohio just State, those two? <laughs> what if it was just Georgia, Ohio State? That's a pretty interesting question, too. Yeah. I think in the 12 team playoff era, I will be more field than I would have been in the 14 playoff era. Yeah, but not if you give me four of the. Uh, of the 11 Best teams power in the country. Five, heck, four of the 10 power five teams if we stay at six for six. Yeah. Right? I mean, you have two teams that just definitely cannot win it, meaning the G5 team and probably the Big 12 team. So, right. you know, hell, three teams that can't win it. Big 12 team, the G5 team, and the other G5 team if we stay at six and six. I cannot believe that y'all are overlooking Florida State's role in this equation. I mean, come on. Well, I was DJ surprised Bud didn't say the ACC team. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought he was going to say as well. No, um, I mean, I, I think there's some ACC teams that have some potential if everything hits right and things go wrong with with these teams. But yeah, I mean, like, what kind of odds would you need if it's Big Ten SEC versus the field? Pretty steep, right? Yes. Undoubtedly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Like five so, to one type stuff. so everybody's all right, officially for Richard's question. Everyone's on the four: Georgia, Ohio State, Texas, yes. Oregon. Yeah. I like the spirit of the question. I just, I think it's more lopsided than than folks realize. Would I take the seventy five percent option or the twenty five percent option? I'll take the seventy five percent option. <laughs> Is that what the math really comes out to? No. No. Okay. Definitely not. I, but. All right. I, so I, Georgia, I, Ohio State, Texas. Alabama is at 11 to 1. LSU is at 13 to 1. Of course, I'm at I'm pulling up FanDuel Sportsbook, make every moment more. Michigan at 14 to 1. Ole Miss at 15 to 1. Florida, we're already down to Florida State, Penn State. Okay, I might take the four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one's a little bit more current event based. QC Hawk says if the rumors that Kevin Johns could be the favorite for the Iowa offensive coordinator 
would that move the needle at all? Kevin Johns was previously the offensive coordinator at Duke, where he did a very good job with Riley Leonard and that offense. Um, Tom, does this does this, yes. does this move? It, all right. <laughs> yes. Moves the um, needle. Yes. I mean, I, we talked. We were talking about this after the show. Yet the Harbaugh show when we went off air. Um, I don't think there's a coach they could hire who wouldn't be an upgrade over what they had. So first of all, I think you've got an upgrade here at the OC spot. And I think it is like part of the, part of the calculus that we don't know is what will Kevin Johns be allowed to do? <laughs> like if he's coming in, are they going to run the same offense they were running at Duke or is it going to have to be a little more Iowa fight? I don't know. I'm guessing it'll be a blend of the two things. But I just think that there are ideas in what Kevin John's offense does that might not be mind-blowing to the football world in general, but they're different concepts than what Iowa has been doing. And I think that if you just – Iowa does not need to revamp everything it does. But it could stand to add a couple elements that they haven't used before. Like, you know, hey, did you like know offense? quarterbacks can move? Like, they don't have to just stand in the pocket. You can use them as a runner, and it actually helps your offense. So, yes, I think if I'm an Iowa fan, it's like I'm not sitting there thinking, all right, we're going to go score 40 points per game or anything, but you're going to have a much better offense than you've had the last few years. So they have not had a receiver clear 600 yards hmm. since smith Marset in 2019. And there then prior go. to that, uh, DJK. Yeah, but in what year? Like 2009, 2009. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, Matt Vandenberg had 700 yards back in 2015. Remember Matt Vandenberg? Kind of. No. I am being unfair, but that name sounds like they converted him from tight end to wide receiver. Yes, I totally agree with that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then he I, just couldn't block, so we better play him at receiver. <laughs> Like we we know other coaches in the Big Ten think that Iowa recruits receivers at, at like a Mac level, like a good Mac level, but they're like, yeah, you're getting like Toledo, Miami, Ohio level kids at receiver because they know Iowa won't throw the football and they don't recruit quarterbacks worth a damn. Um, I still think Kevin Johns is an excellent hire. I'm very interested to see the size of the bag you're having to throw at Kevin Johns to get him to take this job. My guess is it's like three years guaranteed total of $4 million guaranteed after state mm -hmm. tax and paying your agent, you're still walking with like two and a half for, for a three-year period. I, that's a pretty good deal if you're an OC, right? And if you fail, nobody will really hold it against you because you're running offense for Kirk Ferentz. But can you move up to a job? Like, when's the last time an Iowa offensive coach got hired away for a promotion? See, here's like, there's part oh, of this. been a minute. Part of the equation is too, like, how old is Kirk Ferentz? How much longer is he there? If you come in as an, if you come in as the OC at Iowa and you actually give them some sort of excitement on offense, and then Kirk Ferentz steps down, guess who's one of the lead candidates to take over the head coaching job? Yeah, that's fair. It's a good job. Yes. You mentioned uh, ability to use running quarterbacks. I mean, Deacon Hill ain't running the ball. No, like Cade no. McNamara is healthy. He's not running the ball like that becomes a personnel issue. Like you may want it, but you don't got. <laughs> you Transfer don't exactly portal is always open, Daniel. Jackson back there. <laughs> they they do have a kid who they took this year. I, I I actually saw him at the Elite Eleven in Orlando. This is why we go to these these things, by the way, because we're, we're able to uh, to talk. What, what the hell was his name? Um. So James Reeser, he's at Bishop Kenny in Jacksonville. I think he's a much better athlete than he is a thrower. If you guys are picking up what I'm putting down here, like mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, the composite list him as a quarterback. We list him as an athlete. So I'm like, this guy's testing numbers are elite. His throwing numbers are, uh, are not elite. So maybe they can work in some packages with him to use his legs or something there at Iowa. Cause he's like six, four, 200. And the guy, even Sounds by like state of Florida. Know. Yeah. Like even by state of Florida standards, he's, he's a good athlete, like legit. So in 2022, because with 2023, you lose Riley Leonard in the Notre Dame game, and we saw what the backup quarterback situation looked like coming down the stretch. Like Duke's offense was just, you know, a shell of itself. So I'm going to take the 2022 season as my best full body of work to judge Kevin Johns. Third best rushing offense in the ACC. Only Florida mm -hmm. State and Louisville were better. 
And they did that by spreading the ball around to lots of different players. It was Jordan Waters. It was Jacquez Moore. Like they were able to take players that individually you're not saying like, oh, that's an all conference player. And I'm, I'm really sorry for going broken record on this, but the thing that's always impressed me about Johns is he finds unique ways to take pieces and set them up for success. And if you're dealing with a skill level talent at the wide receiver position, or even at the other skill positions that is not quite up to par, he has experience of being able to put players who are not necessarily the best in the conference and the unit as a whole is delivering results that are among the best in the conference. And so I think that for what you need to do to make Iowa successful on offense, Kevin Johns was at least able to show that at Duke. I would like to uh, um, to point Iowa fans to the game in like late October, kind of around Halloween, when Duke was down both of their starting quarterbacks, had to run out a true freshman. They were down, I think, their two best offensive linemen. And they still found a way at home to beat Wake Forest, which had a decent defense and a horrendous offense of its own this year. Uh, and they scored a decent number of points and moved it. And, I mean, yeah, the kid threw some kind of ugh, interceptions and whatnot, but I thought that was one of John's best coaching jobs of the year. Like, I've never met Kevin Johns, but, like, just from afar, I'm like, this guy's actually pretty damn good. So, first of all, if this happens, nice hire by Iowa. Congrats to Kevin Johns on you know, probably joining a new tax bracket even. And uh, and very cool. Like, I'm excited to see what he can do with lesser talent. Yep. They do return four or five on the offensive line, and they get back their tight end. So um, can you convince some transfers in the spring window? Because, like, they're banking on Caleb Brown. But I, I don't know if he can play. Like, maybe he can. I don't think he's terrible. He's probably an upgrade athletically over what they've had. But the rest of these guys, like, Iowa doesn't recruit receivers worth a damn. So, you know uh, – they probably need to hit the portal to get at least one. Will be very interesting. We'll be keeping our eyes on it. Coming up on the other side, obviously the biggest news of Wednesday night was not Jim Harbaugh leaving Michigan to go to the Los Angeles Chargers. It was the full release of the ACC schedule. So what did we see? Where are some of the biggest games? Where do they fall on the schedule? Who got a tough break and... What's it going to look like with SMU, Stanford, Cal all on the slate? Uh, plus, a big recruiting win for Kalen DeBoer. We'll get into that, plus more of your questions next. The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute leading up to Super Bowl 58. CBS Sports HQ at the Super Bowl. Getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. This league is decided by quarterbacks. He showed a lot of character in that moment. Great perspective, Joe Cena. It's the moment you've been waiting for all season long. Ready, set, face. Back here on the Cover 3 Podcast, it's January 25th. That means there are three days left for you to vote for us for the Sports Podcast Awards. That's right. The Cover 3 Podcast is once again a finalist for the Best American Football Podcast category in the Sports Podcast Awards. And to help us win it. I mean, again, we have been finalists before. We have not won it. We need your help to do that. So there's a QR code on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. There is a link in the episode description on YouTube and on the audio side wherever you get your podcasts. And the whole process of voting only takes about 30 seconds. Just get in there, you know, give email, boom, got it. We're ready to go. And that gives us a better chance of being able to win. We thank you in advance for your support of the Cover 3 podcast. Your support has gotten us to the point where we have been a finalist multiple years running. But now let's win the daggum thing. Give us a vote in the Best American Football Podcast category of the Sports Podcast Awards. We thank you in advance. Before we get to the ACC schedule, let's uh, let's hit this one from Sam. Sam says, there was so much discussion about the running clock rule before the season, but it didn't seem to be a talking point after week one. Was the rule ultimately a good rule? Um, What was, what? I guess it depends on what you mean by was it a good rule. I think that it got a plenty of attention in week one because it was new. And then we just kind of moved on from it because you just didn't really notice it anymore. But it clearly had an impact, not in the length of games, as far as TV windows are concerned, because the games, I don't think if you look at the numbers, it may, you might have shaved a minute or two off of the average game time. 
But look at the point totals. Remember how rare it was to see point totals in the 30s? Last year, every week, we had like five or six or seven games where the point total was like 37 because it was shaving plays overall. So if your goal was to make games shorter from a play perspective to reduce reduce injury risk as you're adding more games to the schedule, then, I mean, it was an effective rule. Whether it's good or not, that's not really for me to decide. Three hours and 22 minutes, uh, according to the NCAA, in for the average game length of an FBS game uh, this year in 2023, that is down four minutes, four minutes from the average in 2022 and five minutes from where it was in 2021 and 2020. I think it made non-competitive games end faster. You know, like the idea of sim mm -hmm. to end. Like when Which a game was... Which, which is good, and it didn't you know, change the opportunity. There are still ways. We still had frenetic endings, right? We still had teams that were able to you know, get a first down, get out of bounds, and the clock stopped because the clock stopped on the first downs in the last two minutes. We were not robbed of the drama that we get in late-game scenarios while also the games that were not competitive, we were able to just get them over with faster. I say good rule. From a viewer standpoint, we didn't lose all that much time, as you mentioned, Tom, but the viewing experience, I think, was overall enhanced. Yeah, if you can't notice it, like I think was a good point. Like we didn't seem to talk about it much because it didn't have a negative impact. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I do think there was a thought that this would shorten some of the TV broadcasts, you know, the primetime games or the big noon game. None of that happened because those <laughs> are still four hours because they got to get those mm -hmm. ads in. So, like, that was that was probably the one thing that was probably not accurate when it was surmised that that could have an impact on the length. You know, because everyone's like, "Oh, I'm tired of these four-hour games." Now, nah, those those are still here. Yeah, general rule of thumb: the more promos you see for a game during the week, the longer that game is going to be. Yeah. Yep. That's a very very good equation that you can do on that. So yeah, I would like uh, the blue chicken put in there. Baseball, their rules was massive like i was mm -hmm. great and it was a big difference i don't think we they're cutting one more here. second off what's that they i cut, think they are, are yeah. cut one more second off good okay yeah. wow well but i don't know i i go back I, I haven't been in a major league stadium for the new rules but tom didn't you say you almost didn't yeah. like it it's like better it's, it's better, better for tv right for sure but when you're in a stadium you you don't have all that time yeah. to go to the bathroom go get a drink yeah. Getting you go food. get a beer, you go pee because you've had seven beers, you come <laughs> back and an inning and a half is gone, and you're like, What the hell? Just what did I miss? You know, so yeah, that I, I think in person is and... <laughs> it, uh, yeah, I, I, my main thing with the baseball deal was that it is in some ways reducing the number of pitchers who can just do this maximum effort, like stomp around the mound, catch your breath 30 seconds, and then throw as hard as you freaking can. Like, that's not really for about 100 years how baseball was played. And then you had some guys who were bastardizing the rule like crazy. It was like, all right, if I could take 45 seconds, I could throw as hard as I freaking can every single time. Of course, you know what? Like I can lift a lot in the gym if I'm taking like, like if I do it, you know, one rep at a time. Rep, you know? <laughs> so I, I do like that. It uh, If you're bringing kids to the game, I think it keeps them more into it. There's less downtime between pitches. Like I'd be fine if you, you know, if, if you extended it, the time between innings by 30 seconds, like jam another commercial in there. That's fine. But like when the action's on, Keep it on. Mm -hmm. They're all yours, Nashville. Are the Sox moving to Nashville? No. No, Nashville wants a baseball team. Franchise. And, yeah, and I don't know whether it would be a moving team or whether it would be an Philly's expansion fan. thing. Phil, Tom, Tom's a not fan. No. Yeah. All right. I, I, I can see it. Wednesday night, uh, we got the full release of the 2024 ACC schedule. Um, we had gotten a little drip, 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 drip. At the beginning of the week on Monday, and then we came out with week one. Then it was the Thursday, Friday games. Well, now we've got the whole slate. And Bud, you already did a null cast. I so, did. about that, what well, you don't have to go totally Florida State, but I'll at least get let you take lead on this. What were some of your takeaways from uh, seeing the full ACC schedule laid out, at least in terms of home road splits, the rhythms of a season, and sort of how it goes from there? So, uh, I think NC State. And Miami have the two really favorable schedules this year. Louisville has a, a less favorable schedule, I believe, among the teams that I think have a like a legitimate shot to win the league, right? Which in my mind is sort of 
like Clemson, Florida State, Miami in some order, which I'm not really sure on as of January. And then NC State, Louisville, SMU, and maybe the Hokies. If we just like if we get complete chaos, I can't totally you know, rule out some of those teams potentially taking, you know, taking it down. Um, so I thought Miami and NC State had the easiest overall schedule. I think Miami misses Clemson and they get FSU at home, and they also miss another one of those other teams. Um, they did a nice job of scheduling your two biggest games of the year, which, in my opinion, and I might be biased on this, so I'll admit the bias here, Florida State, Clemson, Florida State, Miami, are both on weekends in which I think they have a pretty good shot of being like the national game. Mm. Um, so if you look at this, this is week, I believe it's week six for Florida State Clemson. In Tallahassee. Uh, correct. Yeah. So the other big games against which you would compete, Michigan, Washington, which probably know Iowa, Ohio State, Michigan State, Oregon, UCLA, Penn State, Old Miss, South Carolina, Bama, Vandy, Missouri, A&M, Tennessee, Arkansas. There's like nothing there. You know, if. if if both these teams are zero or one loss in the loss column by the time they meet, that's probably going to be the national game for say Clemson. And then you go to week nine again, if you're the ACC, I got to give you some, some applause here. You might get Florida state Miami in, in like big time ABC prime time because your games that week, Notre Dame Navy, which I'm assuming will be an NBC game. Um, Michigan state, Notre Michigan. Dame. Like Michigan State, Michigan, probably no. Nebraska, Ohio State certainly could be. Illinois, Oregon, we're going to get Tom's thoughts on Illinois uh, to determine the the, you know, the viability of that matchup. Now, Oklahoma at Ole Miss could be one. LSU, A&M, certainly if A&M surprises, uh, could be one. But, like, there's no big Georgia game that week. It's Missouri, Bama. So, I think if you're the ACC, you may get your two biggest games and have put them in really – comparatively weak national uh, like competition slates to, to where you really get them both on like primetime ABC. I also think the part of that too is it's very likely to be like the ABC primetime game because you mentioned those Big Ten games. Those aren't ABC games anymore. Right, exactly. That, like that, If that Ohio State-Nebraska game is big, that'll be big noon Sunday or Saturday, sorry. Or it could be the CBS afternoon game or it'll be the Peacock game at, on primetime. So, no, I, I do think there's a very good chance those games will be ABC primetime unless, you know, we got old Miss Kentucky or something. SEC, SPN, got to put them everywhere now. And we don't have um, we we don't have the Big Twelve schedule yet. But I I have a hard time thinking that if those teams live up to the bargain, that there will be a Big Twelve game that we, you'd put over those. Mm -hmm. So I understand that there is there's not like one spot on the calendar that's always dialed in for it, but. Clemson and Florida State. So this year they play late September, mid October, one, two, three times in the last couple of years, a couple more late Septembers. But, you know, they've also played in uh, mid to late November as well. I think for the Clemson Tigers, the fact that you've got Georgia, NC State, and Florida State as three of your first five opponents is going to set the tone for how things go coming down the stretch. Because after that, Wake, Virginia, Louisville, but at home, at Virginia Tech, at Pitt, then Citadel, South Carolina. You know, Clemson wants to be competing for an ACC championship once again. You, It is going to be a challenge to be able to, you know, start the season hot, no warm-up, and then be ready to play some of your best football against some of the best opponents all there in the first five games of the season. So, you know, in terms of the draw, maybe having those spaced out a little bit, the Wolfpack and the Seminoles might've been a little more helpful. The other side of it is if you can get through there, you know, picking up a couple wins, then all of a sudden you should be well on your way with some key head to head tiebreakers as well uh, for that division less ACC championship race. I will also note uh, this year, we really liked Louisville mostly because of the schedule this year. It's not so much the teams uh, which they play or don't play, but there is some of that. It's this middle stretch. So Georgia Tech at Notre Dame, which is not a league game, but anyway, host SMU at UVA, host Miami. Then you got to turn around at Boston College on a short week and then turn around at Clemson. Much more difficult. That's a seven-game no-buy stretch, which, by the way, everybody gets two buys this year unless you play 
on week zero, in which case you get three buys. Um, because of, of the, we have a five Saturday September and a five Saturday November. So yeah, I get this I, about what once every eight, nine years. I can't remember who is. I think it's Georgia Tech because they play that week zero game. They've got like a thing where they've got like a buy, then they play a game, and then they have another buy immediately after it. So there's like a game in an island. I will say, going back to what you talk about, like with Louisville, that was the one thing I was looking for in the schedule as far as maybe teams that you're not thinking of as great teams who might benefit from missing teams and sneak into the ACC title game. Uh, North Carolina loses Drake May, but it avoids Miami, Clemson, and Notre Dame. Again, that's not a conference game, but still. Syracuse avoids Florida State, Clemson, and Notre Dame. Also has a non-con of Ohio, Holy Cross, UNLV, and UConn. So mm. Syracuse might be decent this year. NC State's only getting Clemson. They don't have Miami or Florida State. And then SMU also avoids Clemson and Miami. So just some things to think, keep an eye on. Be very, uh, Danny, any, uh, any other takeaways from the ACC schedule? Um, no, you guys covered it. I, so like, I, I don't know. I was going to have some snarky comment about why don't we get the same treatment that the sec got on their schedule? Like, and then they it, tried. Yeah, they tried, but like, like what, what, like I'm looking at the non-conference games as the biggest matchups, you know, that are exciting. Not, Oh, who's new, like the newcomers, like, yeah, Florida state has to go to uh, SMU and play them. Like, and it's weird to see Cal on their schedule and you see Stanford you know, littered throughout here, but they're not like when you look at Oklahoma, Texas, or when you look at you, the, the new big 10, you're like, wow, I cannot wait for that matchup. So like, I get it. I get why they're not there. I did think Miami, it's good to see them back playing Florida again. Week one, I thought their stretch was interesting. Um, yeah, I think you guys hit it all. So nobody, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead. Nobody plays Clemson, Florida State, and Miami. Hmm. And I don't think anybody. Which is probably a good thing, right? If you want the perception yes. of the league, like yeah. Winning, yeah, you know, bowl eligible, eight win, whatever it is, teams. That's a good thing. And yeah. nobody, nobody misses all three. I don't believe. They were voting on uh, they were voting on conference expansion, and they're like, so if we add more teams, we are less likely to play Florida State, Miami, and Clemson. Right. Deal. Uh, the Louisville Cardinals, by the way, at Clemson on November second. Then they have a week off. Then they're out in Palo Alto on the sixteenth of November. Fast turnaround to have to play Pitt at home. That's not fun. I'll be I'll be looking for teams after the west coast trip if they don't have the off week after the west coast trip seeing what we got in terms of any kind of trends with this new and this could apply by the way to any of these other cross-country trips that we've got coming up will be uh something to keep an eye on when we get into locks season one more thing um i do believe that they intentionally scheduled to minimize the chance of conference championship game rematch at least with a short turnaround so if you look at this, like of the teams we think can probably win the league, NC State's final two games are Georgia Tech, UNC. Right. If NC State's playing for the league, those teams are not, most likely, right? Um, the Hokies, the last two games, Duke, UVA. So again, very little chance of a rematch there. Uh, NC or Miami, Georgia Tech, Duke, Georgia Tech, open date, Wake, Cuse. So almost no chance of, of a rematch if Miami is a team playing for the conference title there. Louisville, uh, Cuse, Pitt, open date. So again, their FSU actually doesn't play a league game after November 2nd. They go Notre Dame, open date, Charleston Southern, Gators. And then Clemson is, there's some chance, like Clemson, Virginia Tech on, on the November 9th, but then it's Pitt and, and Colgate and then, uh, you know, the South game Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do think there's some intentionality of like, hey, we're not, we don't want to play like the same game twice in three weeks. Yep. Probably smart. Also, another thing I noticed too, because like there's been a lot of, there's always like the dark horse talk. This team's going to surprise people. And I've seen a lot of Virginia Tech hype for the way that they finished the season, how much they have coming back. Then I saw their schedule. <laughs> and It's like, it's not overloaded. It's just the way that it's put together. Like, first of all, you do have two power five or power four opponents. Sorry. Good. I learned that in your non-con with at Vandy and Rutgers, but they're Vandy and Rutgers. But you open ACC play on a Friday night at Miami. Then you're traveling all the way across the country without a buy-in between to play Stanford. You're at Syracuse. And the next week you get Clemson at home 
but it's after four straight games between buys. It's just, it's like, I think I'd probably start selling my Virginia Tech and get to the ACC championship game stock if I'm holding it. Mm, very interesting test for Brent Pry and the Hokies as they take on some expectations heading into 2024. So we teased it a little bit before, but there was a recruiting win for Kalen DeBoer and the Alabama Crimson Tide as we get a recommit. Ryan Williams, the five-star wide receiver. Remember, he reclassed into the 2024 recruiting cycle. I guess there was a potential. Could he reclass back to 25 and just have this thing wide open? What, what, what did it look like coming down the stretch for Williams? And now, of course, the headline being that he has recommitted to the Crimson Tide. I suppose he will sign in February. That's the expectation. Yeah, so he reclassed. Uh, he was committed to Alabama for a while as a 25. Um, he's an Auburn legacy. So Auburn really thought they had a great chance to flip him and put him with uh, with, with Perry Thompson and Cam Coleman in that class for kind of that you know dream team Auburn thing. And he was set to take a visit uh, to Auburn after his visit that just happened uh, to Alabama. But Alabama actually did such a good job, they got him to shut it down. And this is a pretty big deal. I mean, five-star kid, we very rarely like take a reclass kid and make him a five-star, but I mean, he moves around like Devontae Smith. So it's kind of hard to watch him be like, uh, yeah. So he's he's an elite level player uh, for sure. And for him to, to go back to Alabama and not and, and cancel the visit to Auburn is a huge win for Kalen DeBoer. Now he's a receiver and Washington is going to put three receivers in the NFL mm -hmm. draft this year. So mm -hmm. that kind of makes some sense. And Jamarcus Shepard, the Al new Alabama receiver coach, uh, I believe that hires official, like that's a huge, huge deal. Uh, for them to get him and, and for them to get Williams to commit. But it also really stings for Auburn. I, I thought Auburn was going to be able to pull this flip off. I put in kind of a you know a lower confidence crystal ball. I was like, all right, do I change it? Will I not? And then he shut it down. The the He's not going to visit Auburn, apparently. So uh, big loss for Auburn there. Huge win for Alabama. It does make you wonder, like, if Auburn had gone and got a transfer quarterback who can play, would this be different? I don't know. Uh, but – Auburn's got to be sitting on some cash here because they had some guys that went out down the stretch and they kind of finished second for L LJ McCray, Ryan Williams. They didn't, ha they didn't have to blow cash on a transfer quarterback. They can't be playing, you know, paying Peyton Thorne very much. Is Auburn our sneaky dark horse for just the team that goes like Ole Miss times two next year on, in, in, on the other uh, portal trail and everything? I mean, they just money can't. <laughs> I don't even know if we have to wait completely the next year. I feel like it could be pretty green on the planes this spring once there's that second wave of transfers. But I think, like Ryan Williams, yeah, coming to Alabama for that visit, how did they keep him from going to Auburn? Well, they sat him down. They showed him video of Washington's offense last year with Michael Penix and three NFL receivers. Yeah. Then they spliced in between plays of Peyton Thorne throwing the football. <laughs> I mean, they were like, so just just throwing that out there, letting you see what you want, make your own decision, Ryan. We know you'll make the right one, like subliminally, just yes. super, oh, like, yeah, yeah, I love just it. Flashes, in there. <laughs> just flashes of Peyton Thorn missing guys. Jordan, when we cut the short for this, please do that. Like, I want, <laughs> I want like quarter second clips of Peyton Thor Peyton Thorn misses. But fl just flicker on the screen. Like, did, did I just yeah. see an awful throw? I don't, I don't, I don't know. My brain's telling me I don't want to have that. Yeah, and then the deep shot. Then Because we've got the Milro deep shots there, too. Like ones where Bond is just beating his man, gotten behind the defense. I mean, this this could be you, Ryan. Come on. This could be you. Be very good work by Kalen DeBoer and that staff, uh, as Bud mentioned. Coming up on the other side, we're going to open up the big old bag of mail. With a very timely topic, what are some of the most overrated and underrated coaching hires the last decade or so? Next. It's Back here on the Cover 3 podcast. Those of you watching along on YouTube, you just saw a promotion for CBS Sports coverage of the Farmers Insurance Open. Reminder, that is third round on Friday in the afternoon. That is final round on Saturday. Tom, how is our, uh, how's, how, how are we looking with our outrights and matchups? Uh, we're very, I mean, we're very, very encouraged by our Nikolai Hogard top 10 this weekend because there yeah. were 
two players who finished in the top 20 after round one who played the far more difficult south course and he's one of them and he gets to play the north course today so you know he might be he might be leading this thing by the end of round two listen i'm we might have a new wednesday segment golf golf <laughs> let's see tom swings or something <laughs> like that driving driving with tom tom drives <laughs> we'll see all right so we're going to start with just the traditional big old bag of mail where if you go and leave us a five-star review and in that review, you put a question, we will throw it in the big old bag of mail, tackle it in a future mailbag episode. This is from Andrea. Andrea says, from an avid lady listener who has been following the pod for two plus years, all of the recent coaching carousel movement has me reflecting on how drastically the perception of a quote, good hire has changed over the past decade. Who would you rank as some of the most overrated and underrated head coaching hires in the post BCS era? Also, sorry, ACC boys, but Tom is my favorite. Go blue. <laughs> when women love me. Andrea loves Tom. All right. So I, when I sent this along um, in the rundown, I said the CFP era post BCS seemed a little clunky, but you get what I'm saying. We're talking like post 2014, that the new era that we have just you know closed the book on with the 14 playoff. Um, overrated and underrated coaching hires from that time. I mean, can can you say Lance Leipold is underrated at this point? Like this is like this was what was difficult about answering this question for me is that. I feel like we're smart, <laughs> so we re we recognize the underrated guys and kind of hype them up. So I I don't know. It's it's hard for me to figure out who's underrated because it's like you can't say Kalen DeBoer is underrated. He got Washington to the playoff and now he's the head coach at Alabama. But had Washington not made the playoff this year and finished like ten and two, we'd probably be saying he was underrated. So I don't know. All right, so I'll start with one. I like guys who did a lot better than I thought they would do. So you're doing the under see because I think overrated's easy. Yes. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Like, Jimbo Fisher. Everybody comes in with a ton of hype if you get hired by a major program. Right. Because if you get hired by a major program, you at least need to have some qualifications that make you like people can dream on and believe in in order to, to get through the interview process because you got to sell it to your booster. And then if it doesn't work out, you know. Uh how about Scott Leffler? At Bowling like, Green, Green. Like, this yeah. guy ain't done a damn thing. Like he just like, oh, I, I coached Tom Brady. He was like, cool. Like I think a lot of us could look pretty good coaching Tom Brady. They've like gone to multiple ball games. You know, I, I thought that would be a disaster there, and it's just, it's not. And that's a really hard job. So I'll I'll start out kind of small school, and uh, you know, Chris Chris Kleiman at Kansas State. Kansas State fans that. were angry about that hire when it first happened. Like, like mm -hmm. there's part of it is. Well, they got to replace Bill Snyder, so they're not. No, there's not going to be anybody that's fully happy. But like they were, they did not like that coming from North Dakota State. They didn't think it was going to work, and I think Chris Kleiman has kind of built on what Bill Snyder had started. So I thought I think that's a very underrated hire. I got another one. Um, I actually got a bet with Tom on this show bet from like two years ago. We bet uh, would Josh Heupel or uh, Shane Beamer make it past year six? I believe, and I took no on both. And Josh I still Heupel, feel, Josh I still, Heupel's underrated. You could argue they're both underrated. Like, was Josh Heupel their first choice? No. Was he their second, third, or fourth choice? Almost certainly not either. But they seem to have done a really good job surrounding him with stuff and letting him cook in the ways he can cook. And I think he's done a nice job there. So uh, it's a good example, I think, of you need more than just a head coach. You need program support and alignment. But also Heupel has done a better job recruiting there, I think, relative to expectations than what he did at UCF. <laughs> Like we that. we wondered, we didn't necessarily predict, but we wondered if Josh Heupel was just going to be a caretaker who was going to field an explosive offense that could sell tickets while Tennessee wandered through the wilderness with NCAA issues. And instead, he's delivered their first 11-win season since 2001. He's gotten them like up, competing for championships, snapping losing streaks to Florida, snapping losing streaks to Alabama, being able to beat LSU. This is a this is not a caretaker. Like this is a fighter pilot who has rebuilt Tennessee in his image and has upgraded the recruiting operation. Um extremely underrated. It happened late in the cycle amidst scandal, but uh, I think that we we're going to go back and we're going to be looking on the hypo hire 
as a fantastic one. I had Chris Kleiman as well for underrated. I had Jonathan Smith at Oregon State underrated and probably, you know, hopefully if you're a Michigan State fan, you know, um, underrated higher there, that could be really good. I think all we all like it though. I had somebody that fits both because we do have the playoff era. Scott Frost, underrated mm -hmm. at UCF, oh, overrated at Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. See, I've got <laughs> a coach a little bit too soon. I've got a coach who spans almost the entire daggum playoff era as uh, one to bring up, and that's Pat Narduzzi at Pitt. Yes. Hired mm -hmm. in 2015, and he has not had a single – until 2023, until this year, he had not had a single straight-up clunker. This year was a clunker. But until then, you're talking about a coach who was routinely turning in seven, eight-win seasons and – having a program that is built in his identity can withstand producing pros can withstand a lot of roster churn. So yeah, I think Pat Narduzzi may be a, a little bit, a little bit underrated in terms of the hire. I've got one that's been underrated at two schools, Mark Stoops, both by Kentucky and Texas A&M. They underrated that hire. <laughs> what you think Kentucky underrated him when he was hired? I thought they were pretty happy to have him. No, I just wanted to make that joke. About okay. Texas no, no, <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of other guys who fan like fans were just like, eh, and then he ended up being pretty good, you know. Um, Ryan in the chat had Mike Elko for BK for for Brian Kelly, who I I agree with. At DC that, that worked yeah. out extremely well. You know what's not working out well is Dave Aranda. Do we say that one yet? He did mm. take him to a BC or to a a New Year's Six game, a Sugar Bowl, but. I had uh, Holgerson. Holgerson is uh, overrated. Oh, when he left West Thanks, Virginia Houston? for Houston? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because we we thought he was like getting out ahead of a West Virginia fan base that had unrealistic expectations in the Big 12. Yeah, I would I would agree with that one. Um, I think. PJ Fleck. Overrated or underrated? Under at both. I would say. I'd say under. I mean, he's done a decent job. They, they, they go to bowl games more often than not. I, I guess we have to start judging some of these West teams on what it's going to be like when, you know. Oh, I think Brett Bielema at Illinois is underrated. I wasn't going to say it. Um, I Going back to Fleck, I think there was some overrating when they hired him because mm -hmm. of what he was coming off of at Western Michigan. And I think that now – they've been so kind of consistent in what they do that it's kind of taken for granted. So like, I, you could probably argue both sides of the PJ Fleck thing. And I also think that just because of his personality, he's kind of a polarizing figure to many people. When Jed fish arrived at Arizona, I think that was an underrated good hire that we did not necessarily circle and have high expectations for. I'm hundred percent guilty of that. Yes. And I think that when Kevin, someone arrived at Arizona, we overrated the hire because he was Kevin someone coming off Texas A&M and we were like, Hey, well, but it, at Arizona, he'll be able to make it work. Cause remember Rich Rod left under circumstances that were not exactly on field related. And so, you know, then you go to Kevin, Sumlin, like, this is a great landing spot for him. Almost like we were saying he was gonna be Bo Nix before Bo Nix, but obviously that was not the case. Tyron Fetterman with a great call in the chat that I didn't think about for somebody who was overrated. Willie Taggart at both Oregon and Florida state. Yep. Yeah, came in like eight grades. This is a great hire. Maybe it would have worked at Oregon. It certainly didn't work at Florida State. So for whatever reason, and I have my theories on this, in large part, that 2018 hiring cycle was a freaking disaster. And that was the first year of the early signing period. And the way we used to do things was like you would try to like if you're a new coach, you would try to load up a big class that was pre portal. Now we have portal and almost no new coach wants to take a big class of high schoolers unless like, you know, a DeBoer type thing where, you know, you're, you're inheriting a, a whole lot of guys who are, are really good. Uh, so yeah, I, I wonder how some of the, like, I mean, some of these bond in a major way, like a lot of them, Chad Morris, Willie Taggart, there was a couple more. And I think a lot of it was the attrition rates they had on those first full class. It was like 70 or 80 percent after two years in some cases, which is kind of that's not normal. Um, but, Eli Drinkwitz at Missouri, he only he had one year as a head coach at App State, 
and gets hired away by Mizzou. Yeah. That's I'm rooting for, I mean, I remember rooting for him, but that's just because, you know, Barton was around and we had created the myth of the alpha nerd, the guy who can crush it on the chalkboard, but still stuff you in a locker. <laughs> some of these um, guys do. I think it's I too by that. <laughs> so I'm, I see some people putting Alex Golesh at USF phenomenal first year, even David Braun too phenomenal soon. first year, but I think it's too early to say, I mean, clearly they've been underrated to this point, but you do have to sustain it a little bit right before they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, Jeremy Pruitt that. at Tennessee. <laughs> like, Did anybody I mean, really have high expectations yeah. for that? Though? <laughs> that Clay was Travis. back in the time when people were still like, oh, if you get a guy who's ever like, you know, shook hands with Nick Saban, it, it, it could work. And uh, speaking, of, uh, speaking of Jeremy Pruitt at Tennessee, I'd say Greg Schiano's rehire at Rutgers has been somewhat underrated. I mean, they're still. Oh, he doesn't yeah, tell about yeah. Rutgers. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, but I loved that hire from the start. But I think, by and large, people just heard the name Greg Schiano and was like, "What the hell are they doing?" And I think no, like they haven't, not on they this haven't show, not no, not on this show. But I'm saying just in general, the college football populace. And I just feel like they're they haven't broken through yet, but they're incrementally improving. And I feel like they are just hitting on a QB away from being a pretty darn good football team. I feel like there's a there's a category that's different than overrated which is like spectacularly bad. Like what have been the worst hires? Uh, Cause I, isn't that different almost? So I feel like Brian, overrated. Brian like Emerson at Auburn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that like some people, but yeah. I think that was Willie Taggart. Jeff um, Collins at Georgia Tech. Jeff Collins. Yeah, for sure. Chad Morris at Arkansas. Like there's been some spectacular bad where it just came off. All the these guys stuff. hired within, within a one or two year window, by the way, like right when the early signing period came on. Yeah. Disrespectful. Brian, does Brian um, Kelly underrated tell us you, does he get in the proper credit for getting back to back 10 wins or is he about properly no. rated i think he's properly rated properly yeah, yeah. especially because of his longevity all right so Herb Edwards, he, arizona state was a disaster um yeah disaster mario so Chris Chris some, overrated so far but there are some guys who we soon, knew yeah. like i feel like him and tuberville are two guys you could just put in like the, this is a bad hire we can like at cincinnati we can call it from the start these guys are totally washed like they don't yeah, they're that not like less miles in. at Kansas, right? Le less miles mm -hmm. at Kansas, coverable at Cincinnati. Uh, Herb Edwards, Arizona State, like just it's amazing to me. Herb Edwards is like you know, just preaching on, on ESPN now after like after what he did to that staff at Arizona State, like that's insane. Um, um hey, so from the tailgate, there. Danny, I don't know if you've got a hard out, but there's a very Danny specific question, and we love when you show up to the tailgate and you deliver. Here we go. Gregory says, if NIL was around for Danny in the early 90s, is he transferring when he's sitting behind Charlie Ward? And where would he go? Honest answers only. So I would say no, I would have stayed because I didn't have to wait that long. Um, it's such a different mindset, too. I didn't want I wanted to redshirt. Like my plan was to red. And then sit out a year, one year, and then have three years to start. Well, I go there. Kenny Felder was a baseball, like dual uh, dual sport guy. He was a, on the depth chart. He left to go play baseball. Jeff McCrone was like a highly touted guy. He has elbow problems. He quits. And so all of a sudden, it's like, hey, you're the backup. You're the second string guy. And so I was right thrust into that role. Um, and I didn't want to play. I was like, please, Charlie, don't get hurt. Like, I'm not ready for this. So, like, I wasn't antsy. I wasn't itchy, like, ready to go. And it was such a different mindset. Now, I do think if there was ever a time where I would have taken a phone call was after the Miami game, my first year starting, when I got benched. Now, I played awful. I deserved to be benched. But, like, if I got a call from somebody like Caden Proctor did, like, hey, you doing okay? You know, you're feeling okay? <laughs> no, like, you, need, you need a little bit on the back? Like maybe at that time that you could have started a conversation that I would have considered it for, you know, my last year, but things worked out. I had like, cause we had a quarterback competition. I like, I had to earn the job back and thankfully I did, but I would say, you know, at that time there might've been, but no, I, I wouldn't have transferred waiting cause that was the plan all along. And I didn't play. I only started football my junior high school. I didn't play seven on seven every summer, you know, from the time I was 10, like, let's go. I'm ready to step on campus. It was a different environment. So it's hard to, you know, hard to relate. 
It's a good question, though. I like it. Plus, and the number you got two to be school. on the cover of Sports Illustrated as a <laughs> whole. Right. Yeah, a kicker. That's right. That's the best yeah. story. So Scott Bentley came to Florida State. It was after two wide rights, and so we clearly needed a kicker. So Coach Bowden goes out and gets the best kicker, and he he had never kicked the ball in college. He hasn't even kicked the ball in a scrimmage. And all of a sudden, he's on the cover of Sports Illustrated as the savior, savior of Florida State. Well, I was Scott Bentley's host on his trip to Tallahassee. So I'm showing him around town. We hit it off. Like, he clearly, he wants to come to Florida State. We have a good relationship. And one of the stipulations is, like, I want to live with Danny. He's like, I want to be his roommate. So I'm like, all right. Like, I, <laughs> Todd Rebo, I kicked to the curb. He was bullying me. He was a linebacker. Yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he's one of my best friends to this day. But it was not like he was the worst roommate ever, my freshman year specifically. <laughs> so I was like, sure, I'll switch. I'll take on Scott Bentley. I was like, sweet, package deal. He's coming. He gets to live with me. We'll be good. So training camp comes along. He's my roommate. And he's like, hey, I got to go to this photo shoot. And I'm like, I knew he was like getting a lot of pubs. So I'm like, what's it for? And he goes, Sports Illustrated. And I was like, "What? Is, who all is going to be there? He's like, just me. And I was like, who's holding for you? And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, I am. I'm like, you need a holder <laughs> for this. So I got followed him over there. They had no idea I was going to be there. Got my gear along with them. And I, and he like, he had my back. He's like, I need my holder. So there you go. Got the gotcha. cover, cover picture, Sports Illustrated. What is still insane to me, and I saw this in person, was I didn't realize, that was probably the first time I saw like collectors because we would have to our man, like he would get, a bunch of people sending them sports illustrated covers to sign like every week we'd get, you know, 15, 20, sometimes 50 and he would sign them, send them back. And then occasionally somebody would be like, Hey, have the holder sign it too. <laughs> so hey, Danny it. Now with an arrow to you. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's like strong act. Like act like you belong energy and people just buy it. You know, it's like, yep, Oh yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Supposed to be here. Of course I'm going to be here for this shoot. <laughs> All right. What is the, a, how this is from the tailgate as well. How many transfers would Mickey Andrews have caused? Oh my gosh! Now, and see, I don't know the, if he would have survived in today's marketplace because he was such a hardo. I mean, and he could cuss you out. I mean, it was like he was like a Marine drill sergeant the way he cussed guys out. But I will say this: if you made it through it, the guys loved him. Like, you know, they understood he just wanted what was the best for you. But, man, there were some freshmen that were crying after practice after being through a defensive drill and scrimmage with him. My goodness. He's the best. All right, let's do uh, – we'll do one more. Oh, there yeah. It there, there it is. is. If you're watching yeah. on YouTube.com slash Cover 3, we've got the SI cover right there. I mean, just – just, just phenomenal form. Look at you know, eyes Game on the face. prize. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great stuff. Boom. Um, all right. Well, a Lindsey Buckingham special that's been bouncing around the mailbag here for just a little bit. Alexander from the Five Star Mailbag says, "Love the show, Miss Barton, but Danny and Bud have been great ads as they meld into the mix." Question: As a fan out here in Badgerland, Wisconsin has had back-to-back -back disappointing years. With Fickle at the helm and the first year under his belt, is there room for hope of competing for the new 12-team playoff? Is the room for hope for competing for the new 12-team playoff greater than previous incarnations of Wisconsin football? Also, other than seeming to recruit the East Coast a bit better, how is Fickle changing the recruiting landscape for Wisconsin? Um, I think they're, as far as the recruiting question goes, but can be a little better on this one, but I, I think they're aiming higher. Like I think Wisconsin has always kind of recruited well, but they haven't really gone for blue chips outside of a certain footprint. And I think that they're taking a little more swings. And I think that based off of Luke Fickle's Cincinnati team that had like what eight picks in the draft, they've got maybe a bit of a sell there. So I think that's changing a little bit, but as for the playoff question, like you have to consider them a contender because of the history that they've had in the Big Ten and their ability to win 10 games. But you look at their schedule this year and you can see either opportunity or obstacles. They get Alabama coming to Camp Randall early in the year, very early in the Kalen DeBoer era. That could be a chance for what we were now have to refer to as signature or resume wins when it comes to college football playoff resumes. But then they're at USC. They get Penn State at home. They're on the road for Iowa. They get Oregon. They're on the road against Nebraska. 
Like they can get there if they win those games and they're finished nine and three. You have to think that with depending on that means they've won two of those five games. You have to think they're going to have a resume for one of those at large spots for the other teams that will be competing for the spot to get it. So, yeah, you could say they're a player. But based off of what I saw last year, I still think there's a little more work that they have to do. If Tyler Van Dyke gets back to the kid I thought he was as a freshman and helps elevate that offense to a better position than it was in this year, that could cover a lot of ground and make up for a lot of mistakes. But I still think that they probably need another year of a cycling talent in there to really get to that level. Yeah, they, they don't get the friendly draw with, with, with the new schedule. Now, you do dodge Ohio State and Michigan, but like you're – it's a pretty difficult schedule when you include Alabama in there. They would have made the playoff in 2016, 2017, and 2019 mm -hmm. if it was this current format. I actually do think Fickle is recruiting better, uh, and I I think they'll have a higher hit rate than they have recently. But will it be enough to overcome the increased schedule difficulty? I, that I don't know. I, I think the Big Ten is going to get four teams in the playoff this year. Right, so, nine and nine and three, which is a, I don't know if it's ceiling, but it's like getting your head pretty close to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Nine and three in the Big Ten with that schedule has you as a contender. You are at least like going into the late November. You know, you're going in with a shot. You might need a little bit of help, but I think that if Wisconsin is nine and three at the end of the regular season, they're either in or you know, going to be one of the first ones bubble. out. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bubble team. Yeah. And I don't know if nine and three gets them in um, because I think that the big 10 has a really good shot of getting Penn state, Ohio state, and Michigan and Oregon under the playoff. Or who yeah. are they bumping out of that list? True. But I think 10 and two is going to be a lot more difficult to get to now because no, I, all I those teams that you mentioned have to play all play those same teams. Yeah. So it's, I think nine and three is going to be good enough to get in most for a lot of teams. I think we're going to see at least one nine and three team in every year. They have a lot more games that I think are kind of sneaky losable than that. Certainly if they go nine and three, they will be in the discussion. I, I anticipate. I don't know that they're going to go nine and three. Mm, yeah, exactly. I think eight and four is probably a lot more likely than nine and three, to be honest. Yeah. Also, also just good. another qualifier. For a guy, side, Danny. For, for a guy like Fickle, who was a developmental coach at Cincinnati, I think that's why they brought him in there was to be a developmental coach at Wisconsin. You got to give him time to develop those players. So I would say mm -hmm. give it one more year before you're, you know, starting to chalk this. I think it would be, I think it would be a surprise story if they're in the 12 team playoff in 2024. I will say for Fickle, uh, it does not get easier in 25 because it no. is at Alabama, at Oregon, at Michigan, and host Ohio State. It is never getting easier. So <laughs> and it's and like the way the question was worded and and like Alexander, thank you so much for the question, but I, I might've stumbled a little bit on it, but bud nailed it. And I'm glad that you've got this already in your mind, which is if we had the 12 team era, what of these other seasons would have mattered? And bud said 2016, 2017, 2019. And I think what the question was saying is, do you feel like Wisconsin is in a better chance to make the 12 team playoff than they are? They were in previous years. I'm going to say no. And I'm going to say no because of the big 10 schedule. Because yep. when you were just playing six games against Big Ten West teams and drawing one of, rarely two, of the powers from the East, you were playing a schedule in conference that was easier than what you got. And that's why in 16, 17, and 19, you had a performance that in a 12-team model would have had you in the playoff. I think it was easier in 16, 17, and 19 to make what would have been a hypothetical 12-team playoff than it is in the new-look Big Ten the way that they do the schedules with the monster that is Oregon joining the conference along with USC, UCLA, and Washington. Now, I, what is instructive here is Iowa would have only made one 12-team playoff. And that was the one where the they Oregon. were like undefeated on Big Ten Championship it was Saturday. In 2015, whatever the record was there. I, I went through and made sure I followed all the rules for selection uh, with the six and six format based on the committee's prior rankings. Um, we don't know how the committee will rig it now that they have to actually pick 12 teams. Right now, I think they just pick four and just, you know, five through 25 justifies whatever they decide to do, one through four. But assuming the committee's honesty, which is dangerous to do, but that's all I could really go on here when I made this up. I mean, 
like Iowa's made a good number of Big Ten championship games in the last decade, right? Two Correct. or three? Three? Just at least two. Yeah, for sure two I could think of. I think it's probably three. Um, you know, you think about that. Now you have the new schedule. It, it's You could argue it's harder for Iowa to make the 12-team playoff than it's going to be for them to actually play for the Big Ten title. Maybe. I think sorry, the, the, rever the reverse of that. I reverse, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Easier to make the playoff than it would be to make the Big Ten championship game. Yes, I think yeah. so. And it's mm -hmm. easier for them to make the playoff now because they don't get embarrassed in the Big Ten championship game. Yes. Yeah. The teams that would have made it the most often who like who did not. Uh, Penn State would have had six more in 10 years. Uh, USC, four more. Baylor three, Florida three. By the way, Dan Mullen's probably still the Florida coach in the 12-team playoff era. 15 you know? and 16 are both playoff years, and then 2020 is a playoff year in the 12-team era. For Penn State? No, for Florida. 15, oh, no, I, 16, and 20. I had it as 18, 19, 20. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and then, let me see, Ole Miss three times, Utah three times, Wisconsin three times, K-State two, UCF two. Nobody else more than one. As far as extra appearances. Got it. Who were not already in the playoff. Like now, Ohio State would have made it five additional times. You know, uh, Georgia four, FSU three, Michigan two, Michigan State two. That's actually interesting. Uh, I, Notre Dame two, Oklahoma two, Oregon two, TCU two more times, Washington twice more. Going back to your point, Chip, about how it's more difficult for Wisconsin, I think you're correct in that life will be more difficult for them but i think the part of that equation is life's more difficult for everybody because mm -hmm. yes ohio state had to play michigan and penn state every year but now they're going to have to play usc they're going to have to play oregon they're going to have to play washington they're going to have to play all these other teams that are now coming to the league and it's the same thing in the sec like okay if you get rid of divisions you're not going to have to like in the sec west cool but you still have oklahoma and texas coming in so there's more roadblocks in the way for everybody very interesting. We appreciate all of the interaction, those who come and hang out with us live, those who submit questions through the big old bag of mail. Uh, we got some Penn State on deck. We got some LSU on deck. And also a very interesting question about should the Big 12 rebrand? Dive into that in a future mailbag episode. Brett Yormark submitting questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the all right. Well, no, we'll save it. Okay, 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 okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I like it. So, five-star review, put your question in the review, or come hang out with us live 11 a.m. on Thursdays. We always, always, always appreciate it. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fennell. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. See y'all. See ya.